a rather chilly Johannesburg. It is winter after all here. Um, I welcome you all to the webinar series from Ray of Green Sustainability. The series is called In Conversation With, where every session I deep dive into a variety of topics relating to the creative economy and its relationship to sustainability. My name is Ridwana, and I am the sustainability lead designer and concept creator. I work, I co-founded a consulting agency called Creatively Connected, um, and I take brands on a journey from ideation to production in an environmentally sound manner. So just a little bit of housekeeping before we begin. I do have a poll run, I'll, I'll set the poll up in a second. Um, and if you'd like to participate, that'd be great. The poll is just asking, I'm going to set that up now where everyone is dialing in from. I think that the results will be shown to all the panelists soon. And um, in the chat, if you can use the chat function, just let me know, because I could only put continents based um, on the poll, but if you can just pop it in the chat, which country you're dialing in from, that'll be really, really amazing. Um, and if you have any questions, please don't put it in the chat. Could you rather use the Q&A function at the bottom toolbar of your window? And great, so we're already having some answers. Can all the panelists see the answers? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, we've got quite a spread of people. Um, we've got Asia at 10%, Europe, 5%, West Africa, we've got a lot, 21% from Southern Africa, 16%, North America, 40%. Okay, great. And I'm just going to pop over to the chat. We've got Oregon, India, Cape Town. Uh, there's still more coming in. Let's give it some time. Okay, so in a world where the future was literally just fast forwarded, thanks to COVID-19, every industry was beset with its own set of unique problems, but none as challenging, I think, as education. From primary to tertiary education, the very models on which the systems were built has been turned on its head. In conversation with me today, discussing the future of footwear education, both globally and particularly with an eye on Africa and how it intersects with sustainability is a stellar panel from some of the industry's most prolific thought leaders. I'll introduce my panel um, alphabetically. I'll start with Chidinma. Chidinma Chikwemeka is the co-founder of the Footwear Academy in Nigeria, a learning institute that was created to foster economic growth, reduce youth unemployment through traditional shoemaking, by enabling access to markets and employment opportunities and education, the Footwear Academy is already improving the lives of many artisanal shoemakers in Nigeria. Despite the challenges that 2020 wreaked, the Footwear Academy has been able to train more than 130 youth in rural Nigeria this year alone. From Cape Town, South Africa, we have Cyril Nika. Cyril is a veteran fashion consultant, mentor, and sought after speaker at international events for his stance on ethical and sustainable practices within fashion. He spent the last 20 years leading the sustainable fashion movement in South Africa. He is the CEO of Imprint Luxury, a boutique PR and events agency, and is the founding member of Fashion Revolution Cape Town, as well as being the country coordinator for Fashion Revolution South Africa. From Portland, Oregon, I have Dr. Dwayne Edwards. With more than three decades of experience, in excess of 40 filed patents and a presidential award by President Obama, Dwayne founded the Footwear Academy in the first Footwear Academy in the USA in 2010. Pencil Footwear Academy fast became the preeminent footwear school in the US through partnerships with the industry's biggest footwear brands and retailers. To date, more than 475 pencil graduates are working professionals at brands like Nike, Under Armour, Jordan, New Balance, Timberland, etc. And as an educator, Duane has lectured at Art Center, Parsons, MIT, and Harvard. In 2019, he was the fourth person in Art Center's 90 year history to be awarded an honorary doctorate in recognition for his remarkable career and contributions to this industry. Back to Cape Town, I have George Newton. George was one of the first locally trained footwear technologists in South Africa. His career in the footwear industry, both local and international, spans over more than three decades. He has spearheaded enterprise development for, the, for SMMEs in the African region and was instrumental in his role as CEO in the setup of a footwear education cluster at the Val University of Technology in Johannesburg. 
And 2017, he founded a grant-funded research-driven company called Footwear Industry Training, or FIT, that focuses on applied research within the diabetic footwear industry. From Boston, Massachusetts, I have uh, Kathleen Grievers. Kathleen's background in academia is extensive, started with the grassroots approach of part-time teaching and navigating the academic political rigor. She leads the LaSalle University Footwear Certificate Program in the US and also teaches sustainability and ethical standards within the LaSalle School of Fashion. She is also the Director of Education for Fashion Revolution USA and leads international student programming of footwear, automotive and fashion design through her consulting company, Seymour Global. And from a still sunny Amsterdam, I have Nicolene Van Enter. For more than 25 years, Nicolene has consulted with leading footwear brands like Timberland, Birkenstock, Vans, and Diesel. She's known for her broad future vision and ability to connect seemingly unrelated things to create original and effective solutions that are tech-driven and sustainable. She's an expert in applying new digital and biological technologies to footwear. She's currently creating new biotech solutions for footwear and heads up the Footwearists, a digital learning platform for footwear professionals to upgrade their skills and to learn completely new ones. So welcome to my panel. Thank you very much for being here today. And I'm going to just jump straight into it. Okay, so it seems that for the longest time possible, design education and sustainability were on two separate tracks which leads of course to a disconnect in the way designers think and work and create end user products. Um, Cyril, how do you feel about curriculums and methodologies? How do you feel that they can, be, they can better incorporate the very necessary elements of sustainability? Taking into consideration, teaching in ways that are relevant to communities and cultures and environments. Um, Rudwana, thanks for the question. Um, I think before I start, I think it's important to sort of localize, you know, so if we are talking about South Africa, if we are talking about Africa, so it depends where a lot of the, the viewers are listening from, we've also got to take into consideration the diverse economic divide that we have in specific countries. So before we get to the curriculum, we've got to talk about things like accessibility. So, you know, if you're talking about data and internet connection, et cetera, it's not really accessible for many and for all. So we've got to take into consideration that that is something that is fundamentally a problem in countries like South Africa, where the divide is so diverse. When it comes to curriculum, I think um, what was happening in the past, you know, myself, have, you know, having studied fashion, um, the system, the old system doesn't work because sustainability was never taught. Um, we didn't know about zero waste. We didn't know how to use fabric right through the value chain. Um, and I think, you know, in terms of curriculum, there's huge growth and we need to sort of, um, sort of adapt and we need to pivot, you know, so in terms of what is happening currently globally and with trends, you know, and I think also it's, uh, you know, while, you know, I don't want to paint a picture that, um, you know, woe is Africa and poor us in Africa. You know, Africa is rich with so many resources. Creativity is one of them. And uh, I mean, I have a little bit of a show and tell, you know, my favorite pair of shoes, which are Vegas. Uh, okay, so these guys, you know, didn't start from huge amounts of money, you know, and I think it's, a, it's a sort of a lesson in terms of they believed in the story, in the narrative. And I think, <clears throat> you know, the curriculum and the people behind the curriculum need to really understand what is it that we're teaching uh, young learners and what is it that we're wanting to put into society. And I think the learners themselves, you know, there's so many fashion revolution as an example, there's open source, there's a lot of information. So nothing stops one from sort of educating oneself in terms of the direction you want to go. And I think it is important. So we can't sort of say it's the government's fault, it's the country's fault, um, you know, it's the teacher's fault or the lecturer's fault. I think we've got to take ownership. Um, and I think that's the biggest thing. If, you know, obviously, um, if, you know, if history is anything, you know, just going back to my days at, at studying fashion, um, you know, we're living in interesting times, you know, in terms of obviously the pandemic, the global pandemic. And World War II was the same situation, you know, in this is a history of costume where clothing was rationed you know, fabric was rationed, materials were rationed. Um, and yet when World War II had ended, you know, the House of Dior, as an example, 
um, came up with voluminous skirts and tiny waists and catering for people who wanted to celebrate life and celebrate a new season. And I think with COVID, when we come to the end of this, people are gonna to wanna to celebrate, but what are we really celebrating? And I hope that we would be celebrating sustainable living because during this time we should have been sort of really thinking about what have we done to the planet? What are we doing ourselves? And you know, shoes is interesting because it's our main mode of transport wherever we go. So it's not the vehicles that we get into or whatever, it's the footwear that we have. Um, and what better way to leave a lasting impression for future generations on a sustainable platform. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so it, with regard to the same question, um, and we're talking about primarily maybe perhaps open source learning, um, you know, do you think that open source learning could have the cohesiveness that could teach people at a level that actually makes them employable, considering that open source is exactly that, it's free? I think so. I mean, I think, you know, it's really, it's, I guess it's also, passion, you know, the passion that you have. And, you know, one could learn, you know, you could go to a mainstream university and you could learn something and come out with sort of really, you've paid for that qualification, or you could have something that's open source um, and you can kind of, but it depends on the individual. You know, I think if you're hungry enough for success uh, and you are determined, I think you would go at all costs to get it. So I, if the question is, does it really sort of differentiate between if the fact that it's open source and if it's free, I really don't think so. I think it's really in terms of how hard does a person work and what change do they bring about in the industry? You know, so if it's open source, it's great specifically for developing countries because then, you know, more people have access to the information. Um, and mm. I think also, you know, we kind of, um, I think collaboration is also a big thing. You know, if, if we have skill sets, uh, I think we should be sharing those. And I'm sure that everybody on the panel here, are, are part is involved with something where we, if we've been in the industry for, for a long time, we also share what we know, you know? So I think sometimes it's not necessarily, if it's at a paid institution, um, it's really just in terms of the quality of that information. So if it's free and open source, it's also gotta be up a very good standard. You know, it can't right. be substandard uh, because you're also looking for people that are going to be in mainstream employment um, that will be measured according to their skill set. Uh, so it really comes down to what the level of it is and the determination from the individuals themselves. Mm -hmm. Would anyone else like to chime in on this question? Yeah, I, I'd like to say a couple of words because I'm in agreement with what is being said about open source. And I think that what we're seeing with COVID, especially the pivots that have been made with studio courses and courses that are on, you know, top tier uh, education universities, that the professors had to pivot, the professors had to rethink, how do I, how do I explain the idea of clothing construction or footwear construction through an online platform when I think this should have been, you know, done a long time ago. Um, so it's giving that emphasis to that we have to pivot our teaching manner and we have to pivot how we're sharing this information and, and you know if there's a silver lining to COVID it's that we've been able to have more industry on open source platforms and invite them into classrooms and I think that it's it, it is a lot to do with the really the the focus of the student the student how much they push for what they want is so important because you know in the footwear industry what i've found within education is that it's very much linked to the history of of communities working together and and building footwear education in footwear is is like that too I, i'm looking at my colleagues right now that that it's in support of each other. So even what uh, Dwayne was saying before we jumped on to the live call was about how to position education models to further expand other education models. So I think that can happen too. And, and then you have all the resources and pathways for students that have a need for a certain direction, such as the footwearist, if they wanted to do more sole interpretation of 3D printing and more of the technology skills that are needed, there's avenues there. So mm -hmm. I think the more that we collaborate and communicate on symposiums and summits like this, it, it gives the idea that students also have this pathway that they can 
you know, look towards and they can continue to grow at their, at what their passions are within footwear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. That's great. Does anyone else want to chime in? No. <clears throat> okay. So next one, <laughs> in a world of increasing automation and legitimate fears about job redundancies, as machines are increasingly able to replicate certain human efficiencies, uh, Nicoline, what do you think the role hybridization in tech and education can play, especially when it comes to something as hands-on and tangible as shoe design or shoe, shoe, shoe design and shoe making? And what does this mean for developing countries? Thank you so much for asking that because that's indeed exactly the subject that I would like to contribute um, on. I'm also collaborating at this moment with Chidinma, uh, developing some videos with, with her academy as well. So I think my my vision that I would like to see come to fruition is a, is a different approach. What you see a lot of times when developing countries, whether this is on the African continent or elsewhere, when they are starting with the footwear industry, their first thoughts is of jobs, factory jobs, where they're thinking, oh, let's start a factory, let's start making footwear that is suitable for export. And I understand the thoughts. The problem with it is that it might be short-lived. So what we see also in Asian countries where the industry starts like that, you know, where people are coming to the country not for um, high-skilled labor or craftsmen, but for cheap labor. So I always have an issue with seeing footwear as a handcraft product because the flip side of that is exploitation. So uh, that's why we have that circus, basically the moving circus, I call it, from cheap labor country to cheaper labor country to cheapest labor country. And so I would hope that we can break that cycle on the African continent because um, what you see happening now on the, on the technology side, uh, all the new technologies that are coming to the forefront, uh, what people often don't realize is that these are highly... Um, accessible so you can actually enable people who were never able to start manufacturing before to start small factories but with entirely new skills so this could be in, in, involving 3d printers that are no longer so expensive uh, lamination technologies uh, recycling ways maybe even starting which where i see a big opportunity also on the african continent starting with upgrading um the cheap shoes that are or excess stock or worn shoes that are kits to developing countries for you know just cheap sales. I mean, there's so much dumping going on that the companies are trying to prevent. And maybe we can see it as a resource and say, hey, we need more you know, shoes that can be repaired, upgraded. And maybe we can indeed say, well, why don't we start fantastic manufacturing that is high tech from the African continent and then ship those shoes back to you know, upgrade them and ship them back to Western countries if that's what you, if that's what you want. There are so many opportunities there to do that. So I'm really hoping that we can break that cycle of, again, looking at, okay, a lot of manual labor footwear and go straight into teaching people um, technology. And also for that matter, not just looking at manufacturing, but also including the design. So what we see, it's always the perception for developing countries, oh, well, these poor people, they only see them as like a cheap pair of hands you know, and not as, as a person with creativity and other skills. So why not start with design from the beginning? Because even if you follow the model of making shoes for export, you have to understand what to make, what to design, what should it look like, why? And also, for instance, from my side at this moment, there's a lot of need for people who can do, who have digital skills, who can do digital design, 3D modeling. Those things you can all do remotely. So why not start from there and, and also start teaching people who can do 3D modeling right away? So there's free software now that we can use for that. We teach courses in Blender. So relating to the open source question that we have before, there's more and more means that are coming there. The one thing that we should look at when it comes to um, uh, technology is that we need to start working with um, companies that have smart energy solutions. So make solar powered facilities. So the one thing that we were also talking about before we came live is all the difficulties with energy, uh, where you have no power, where there's so many countries in on the African continent that have limited power, limited Wi-Fi. So if we can find solutions there where you say, well, I have my little workspace and it's fully solar powered or something like that, or at least for the larger part, 
um, that could already help. So it's a different, uh, it's a different approach that I would really love to to see and initiate also in, in African countries, uh, using technology as a, as an opportunity. <clears throat> Okay, thank you for that. Does anyone else have any thoughts on this? Duane, I'm curious to hear what you might have to say about this. Yeah, I live in both worlds. You know, I, I live in the, the, I have no electricity world to I have full power of everything. And the, I guess the way that I, I like to teach people is to, to teach with nothing in mind. So don't rely on any tools. Don't rely on anything, right? Just see what you can do from what you have in your environment, where I, I believe in the fundamentals. If you understand the fundamentals, it's easier to do it on the other end. When you truly know the, the process from the very beginning, that is, you know, I'm dating myself, you know, I'm, I'm an old head in, in, in this game. And, and so I'm, I'm just a big believer in you have to understand the fundamentals before you get digital tools. Because I think there's a, there's a learning gap that's happening that, you know, at least in, in North America, there's a learning gap of kids jumping straight to a computer mm -hmm. and not knowing how to even use a piece of paper and a pencil, right? Mm -hmm. Where before a computer, there was these other objects. And if electricity goes out, you give me a candle and I'm good to go, right? And a match, right? Where I just don't want them to be dependent primarily because we, we live in a, in, in a society where there's a shortcut. And kids like to take the quickest, easiest, shortest way without understanding why they're doing it or is that actually the best way versus doing the shortcut and realizing, oh, damn, I got to go all the way back around and do it the right way, right? So they end up doing twice as much work by not understanding the proper way to get to that, to that, to that roadmap. Um, I say I live in both worlds is because I do believe that design needs to be redesigned. I believe manufacturing needs to be re-engineered. I believe that instead of starting with designing something and then you have, you put it through this manufacturing process, why not design the manufacturing process and whatever comes of that, then that's what it is, right? And so I think the more we do that part, we'll buck kind of the traditional process that footwear is because quite honestly, it hasn't changed. It hasn't changed that much from a traditional point of view, but the, but the new way of doing things, even from a digital point of view, they're still putting the digital through the old manufacturing process where 3D printing is, is getting us closer and closer and it's catching up and there's, there's, there's innovations happening every day, which is fantastic. For me, like it would be fantastic to just to redesign the process of how you make something, but you don't, you don't start with making something you start with, okay, let me just see if I can change how rubber is poured or where it even comes from. Um, the stitching process, the lasting process, like those things have not changed in over a hundred years and, and they're dying to be changed. 3D printing will help some of that, but it, it, I think there's another level to it where you have to go into the engineering part of it and add design to the engineering part of the process. Normally, the engineering is in the design part of the process. It's mm -hmm. actually flipping it around a bit. And then that, that way that kid is more well-versed. Yeah. They're not one dimensional, yeah. right? That's a good and, way about what we are doing actually from, from the technology side. It's not so much saying, oh, it's only about a printer. It's indeed redesigning completely. That's great. Printer, you're not doing anything. So we have a course called Footrology for the Future, which is really about completely redesigning the manufacturing process. And it's actually for designers. And that's exactly the type of thing that I would like to do because as you are doing that, and as you're also, because it's one big opportunity I see as well, I completely agree with Dwayne. We want to redesign the manufacturing, which also means that you can start teaching people how to build machines. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Great skill to have, which is often for good. Yes. So we start from building machines, whether this is robot arms, printers, cutters, uh, laminators, or any other machine that people feel they might need to have. But then indeed you start designing from the making aspect instead of, of course, now can people, people can freak out completely on their 3D design and make a fantastic rendering and have no clue whatsoever how they would have to manufacture that. Exactly. So 
you want to go the other way around where you start from the manufacturing side. And this is actually where I, where I see the opportunities, where a new factory on the African continent with the new ways of manufacturing using new resources that are available, such as plastic waste, which we have mm -hmm. a lot there. Um, and then also see that as a, as a way to teach people as well, as a school as such, where you learn uh, all kinds of different skills. So the technological skills, the design skills, um, sales skills, whatever. There's so many different ways you could, you could build that up um, using yeah. it as a tool, not as a, as a goal. It's a, it's a toolkit, not necessarily a goal. That's yeah, and, 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 as, and as long as we're teaching these kids to be resourceful, right? Yeah. And, to be free thinkers and do things that hasn't been done before. Because a lot of them repeat what they see because that's, that's, how they, that's what they think design is. There's, there's a really bad relationship, at least in North America or at least on, on Instagram, there's a, there's a really bad relationship of what design is, in my opinion. It's not what it looks like on Instagram, in my opinion. That's not what it is. And so I think there's a generation of people growing up thinking that, oh, I'm just create this hot sketch and it's going to be great. Hot sketches don't get made. They don't look like that when they get physically made, right? So why even sell false hope? Why even learn through false hope, right? So for me, I'm, I'm more of, I'm more of a, a 1800s type person where I go back to 1883 with Jan, Metz, Jan Metzliger, right, where he had a problem. He could only make 50 pairs of shoes a day. The whole industry could only make 50 pairs of shoes a day. And he was like, well, I need to make a machine that can make us make more shoes every single day. So he didn't try to change what his normal was. He created a whole new machine that became the modern day lasting process, right? So it went from 50 to 700 in one day. But that was him saying, all right, this system is broke, right? I'm not going to accept the system that I'm in. I'm going to create a new system. And I just want kids to have that type of vision to not accept what's in front of them and to challenge what is possible. And that is through opening their minds a lot more to what's possible, both from technology point of view and for no technology, right? Because technology can also be a hindrance of thinking. That's and that's, true. that's my struggle is that it can prevent you from thinking. And mm -hmm. I want people to understand how to think. And then when they get the tools, oh, they're going to do so much more with the tools than you can ever imagine versus the kid who just has the tools. Mm -hmm. They're going to be limited to the tool yeah. because mm -hmm. they know no other process to apply to the tool. So I think it is a balance between those two worlds, uh, especially with the way the kids are and how mm -hmm. much accessibility to technology and instant gratification that they have. They think it's so easy. And I'm like so happy when I get them in front of me. I'm like, yeah, okay, this is real easy. Show me. <laughs> Show me. Can, I, can I add can I add one comment to what you're saying, Duane? Because I think um, you know, part of it too is that uh, you know, between your academy and Nicoline's Academy, they're they're independently run. And when I work with larger universities, it's the it's the politics that happen where, you know, where I think more more concentration of programming towards systems like you said like design systems need to be at the forefront before you start making something you should understand those principles so in working with independent academia and university public private academia there's such a, a, a gap in that and i think that should be highlighted too like even working with you uh university of johannesburg there there was um projects that we wanted to, to work within that structure and there's there's such a political rigor that happens within academia public private no matter what area of the world that it's hard to implement these new approaches to how we should teach design how we should teach systems how do we teach sustainability um, and I think almost on this top tier that needs to be broken open and that needs to be really be dived into and hopefully now is the time that we're going to do that too and yeah, i just I, I, that. I worked with a friend a friend of mine um at, at nike he, he he was in the running group and he started his presentation with i hate running right <laughs> like that was his first slide was i hate running and and when i left the corporate world and, and went to education i had made a t-shirt i gotta find it it said i hate education <laughs> because it was so broken and it was so busted 
And there was, it just did not make any sense because the original intent was lost through the politics, yeah. through the layers. And that's why these big institutions are struggling during COVID, quite honestly, because they weren't not prepared because they can't turn as fast as say, myself and Nick, Nicole, you can turn, I can turn, I can switch. Like, That's it's right. our fault if it goes wrong, right? So, so I would rather be driving and it's my fault I crashed yeah. instead of riding in the car with someone and they're not paying attention. And I'm like, you should be looking at the road <laughs> <laughs> while not looking at me, but looking at the road. And I just think education is, is built that way from a structural point of view where I have to re-educate people who got degrees. Yeah. yeah. I have to re-teach them what education should be. Yeah. And they already paid for it. Yeah. And they come to me for free, right? So, <laughs> and, and I'm just like, okay, yeah, w when you finish, go ahead. Sh come hang out with me and I'll make you destroy, I'll destroy everything you learned for four years. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Cyril, you had something, I'm sorry, Nicolene. Oh, Cyril, you had something to yeah. say? I wanted to pick up on Kathleen's comment, you know, in terms of, uh, I think Kathleen, we had this discussion in London at the Fashion Revolution um, uh, sort of summit, where we spoke about the politics and, you know, sort of the diversity in South Africa, specifically Johannesburg. Um, but also, you know, to pick up on, on Duane's comment, and I saw someone here put a comment about, uh, you know, not all of us are young, you know, and I guess coming back to the open source situation and versus the people that have degrees, et cetera, et cetera. I think it's such a, a level playing field right now, you know, in terms of what um, the opportunities for people that literally have the passion may not necessarily have the skill sets, but I guess the, um, the flip side of that coin is then you get into a situation where there's politics and it's a little bit difficult, you know, so I guess in the ideal world, you're kind of looking for where one can teach sustainability and teach good education where there, there aren't these factors, but it isn't so, you know, and I guess one's got to think about where we're at, you know, so if we're in South Africa, what is the climate, you know, what is, what is the political situation right here? And how is that curriculum adapted? And then also, you know, with Nicolene, um, I think it's so your comment about, um, you know, that we're not just free hands or cheap hands, yeah. you know, um, and, and I think in the past, what used to happen was a lot of people would come to South Africa to, to pick up on all the trends and culture. And, you know, obviously now we have a word for it in terms of cultural appropriation. And they would go back and they would do these amazing designs and they, they would take out of this country. Yeah. You know, they would take out from our creativity and our resources. And I think it's time now that we kind of step up, you know, and locals sort of say, hey, listen, we're not, we're not interested in stuff from the West that's going to you know, get into our landfills. Um, you know, we have enough resources here. We want to create some amazing things here. So, you know, I'm just picking up on the, on the conversation that we've been having, but it's just interesting, you know, in terms of, I, I firmly believe the time for Africa is now um, and we need to be doing that. And we, we need collaboration and we need the support, you know, in terms of what you were saying. Yeah, but I think it brings up a good point. I think that the type of schools like, like Dwayne has and like I have that are independent, even though we each have different business models, so I think there are only two professionals, and so Carol, who brought up the question, like Carol is one of my, my, my participants, my students, and yeah, she, she is uh, not the student age uh, anymore. Um, and, and I think it's really necessary because I think one of the hurdles that we have to face um, when we look at the African continent and other developing countries that so often the education system that is desired also by parents for their children is academia. So it's traditional academia. They look towards the American system of, of highly expensive schools uh, with the more, because the idea is you need your diploma. You need this certificate. You need this thing on your wall that says that you are a qualified whatever. And it's, it's a hindrance because it not only does it take a lot of time to set up, it's going to be unaffordable for a lot of people to join any of those programs, either because they don't have the right education uh, that they have before, not the money, they're too old, they're, they don't live close enough. Uh, all that, again, we're looking at um, how we can transform education now also through online education, we need to really focus in different, in different African countries to get that started uh, much faster uh, at, a, at a different level without having to go through traditional academia. 
it will be a challenge because parents often will say, but I want my child to have an official university degree. Um, where I had the experience in Vietnam when we were trying to set up a school together with Nike because they wanted that for footwear technicians, where the school said, okay, yeah, but we need somebody who has a PhD in footwear technology to be the, <laughs> yeah, so that was my response to the lead the school. I was like, there are no people with a PhD in footwear technology, not even a master's because it doesn't exist and it's the same right. option for the design side or whatever side. So what you want are these fantastic people who have lots of experience who might be you know, willing to teach part time or so many people that come out of the industry now that are close to retirement age and would love to teach and have yeah. very recent knowledge and experience, but they don't even qualify to run the workspace in a traditional yeah. university because they don't have the degree. Yeah. So I really hope that we can like, like, like Chidinma school that we can, that we can find different, you know, different types of education that can indeed jump on the opportunities in the market much quicker, educate people more quickly, make it accessible to people that need the education and not go the traditional university route. Mm -hmm. well, you walked literally right into the next question that I was going to ask Dwayne anyway, which was the relevance of formal university education the way we've always seen it. Because HRs globally still seem to favor any candidate that has a string of alphabets behind their names. And, you know, I just, I, I think that I'd like to know what your thoughts are about, you know, maybe perhaps like things like corporate universities emulating what corporate universities are doing. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm so let me, let me preface it in case there's some kids listening or some parents listening. Um, I still do hate education, but I think it's, 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 if you have the means to do it and send your kid there, make sure you send them prepared, right? Because don't send them there thinking they're going to come back exactly the way you hope that they would come back. And, and what, what I mean by that, my daughter, my, my middle daughter, she goes to SCAD. She's a fashion design major, but she was ahead one year before she started. So I was like, all right, you serious? This is what you really want to do. All right, so I'm going to start developing you now. So when you get to your first year, you already know what they're going to teach you. So now you can actually just refine what you learn every single year. So you're always a year ahead. Now, she has the advantage of having me as a father to be able to prepare her for that. So her mindset can be different and, 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 and ready. Most kids don't do that. So what, what's interesting that's happening around the question of the value of a degree um, is the diversity conversation. So the diversity conversation that we're having right now, in North America at least, is that on average, we're not there. You know, African-American kids are not in design schools. We're, we're mm -hmm. averaging less than 10%. It's closer to seven, you know, nationwide. And so because we're not there, and that is the traditional route, the way companies seek new talent, they have a decision to make. Either they are going to give scholarship money for a kid to go to a school that will not teach them what they want to hire for, <laughs> okay, which sounds a little backwards, but well, I don't know, I don't, what do I know? Or create a curriculum that you want kids to have the knowledge of and do it yourself or partner with myself or, or Nicolene or whoever to do what you want them to do, right? And that is a very real conversation all of the top brands are having right now, with me actually, of, okay, well, if I give the big school my money, that doesn't guarantee the kid is gonna go there. And then that doesn't mean they're gonna teach what the kid needs to get hired at my company. So now what the company is starting to understand is the value of in-house education, the value of external independent school partners, right? I had, I had a great conversation with, with, some, with some folks in, in Detroit, a, a big car company. They have their own two-year university inside their own walls because they couldn't get the diversity that they wanted at the schools. So they decided to do themselves. Google did the same thing with, with black colleges. So there's a massive disconnection with black folks in technology. And so they went to different historically black colleges and universities here in the United States and they didn't like what they were being taught. So they're like, all right, cool. We'll just come inside and we'll do it. We'll do it ourselves. We'll just pull the students and send them back, right? 
So you're, you're starting to see these big organizations starting to take control of their destiny instead of waiting for the school system to deliver the student that they want them to deliver. And I don't think it's a trend. I think that's the way it's going to be going forward. Mm -hmm. And because there's a ROI with a big company that's a, that's a publicly held organization, they need a return on their investment. And the faster they can get it, the more smart they look, right? And so right now, if they, if they make the investment in a traditional four-year institution, they have to wait four or five years for that to pay off. And that's too long. And so what I think that higher ed needs to figure out is to be more nimble. They need to figure out a new relationship with corporate America because it is changing. And if they don't change with it, they will be left behind. And it's already starting to happen here um, in, in the US. Mm -hmm. and, and I hope the schools that at least the ones that I work with, they, they know, I mean, because I'm, I'm, I am, Re, you know me, I am just like this all the time. So I am, I am gonna tell you the truth. <laughs> and I told them all, like you were about to not have any students and you were about to no longer have corporate sponsorship money because they are figuring out there's a better use for those funds than giving it to you to go into, to your point, Nicolene, to a institution that doesn't have credible faculty yeah. that are that has done the work for decades because they don't have a piece of paper that they can design themselves and print at their at their house yeah. right yeah. if they want to okay so I, and I've, I, I've seen two degrees in my whole 31 years in this industry one of them is hanging on my wall <laughs> and the other one was at a friend's house in the drawer <laughs> so, so, but do you i've never asked to see one in an interview process because for me it's about talent yeah. Mm -hmm. We're in a talent business, and when the talent business doesn't care where you came from, it's even a better story. Oh, cool, I found this trash man. He can kill it designing shoes. Like, that mm -hmm. makes the company look a whole lot better because they saved so much money on recruiting because he was just the dude who was taking out the trash every Tuesday. Mm -hmm. Do you think companies are interested to do that on the African continent as well? I mean, I remember speaking to the, the Adidas Foundation already a few years ago, where I was saying, I see you guys doing so many charity projects. When are you just going to set up schools, you know, or little factories or something? Mm -hmm. People uh, in the African continent to, to, to design, make, not just wear or buy or just admire <laughs> your stuff, which is often unaffordable for them anyway, uh, but to get them included. Because, of course, yes, we see this development in America, but this is also about the African continent. How, how can we persuade companies to do that? Uh, you know, outside of the Western Hemisphere so that schools like Chidinma School are getting corporate sponsorship as well and don't just right. have to rely on government uh, funding. So let me, and, and you know, we've been dominating this conversation, so we, we need to let the other two people talk too. But um, <laughs> we should talk because it's not about waiting for the company. Because I knew when I left and started, that was the reason why the schools were, were lagging behind, because the school was waiting for the company to give them money. Mm. And the company was waiting for the school to figure it out. And then they'll give them the money, right? So I figured it out without asking anybody for any money. Yeah. And then once I figured it out, they started giving me money. Yeah. That's the beauty, that's the beautiful part of the equation. So I, th I think where, where, where you are, young lady, in, in, your, in your academy, which I would love to hear more about, and, and if I can help you at any point, I, I will share whatever I have with you to okay. get you to build the curriculum you need to be undeniable. So they'll be coming to you saying, oh, I need to work with her. I need to put the money in her institution it, because otherwise corporations, at least in America, I can tell you, they just want you to say yes or no. They, I mean, so they just want to say yes or no, deliver them something for them to say yes or no to. If you work with them to try to figure it out, it takes different smarter brains in bigger orgs to help collaborate and figure things out, which there, there's a lot of those smart people there, but some of them just want an easy yes or no. Like, so if you're saying, hey, I could do this, this, and this, do you want to do it? And they say yes, then you're good. Like you just made, they could take the rest of the day off. <laughs> you, just, you just made their job a lot easier. Uh, okay. so the other Thank thing you, you Dwayne. I want to mention is, is that to have partnerships with 
the universities and colleges. And I'm, I'm happy that I'm at LaSalle University because they do pivot so quickly. And we've yes. been able to work with Chittima and we've been able to, you know, embrace the certificate idea. But I think that's uh, on the ownership also, as you said, Dwayne, of private and public schools within these top tier, you know, higher education forms that they need to open up and support different programs on different continents. They need to have open sourcing because it's, it's no one's really going to copy any curriculum. We're, we're all here to educate a student. We're all on this platform to try and encourage, you know, this new development on the African continent, but beyond that too. So Chittima School is an exact, you know, idea that how come, you know, larger institutions and even smaller ones like LaSalle universities, um, we can help even in getting more curriculum or design or however that she wants to program it, but it should be more open source between the public and private institutions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kathleen. I, I actually have a comment here from um, one of the attendees who says, um, and this is actually, I'm going, to, I'm going to shoot this one at you, George, simply because it is precisely what you're trying to build with FIT anyway. It says, I would like to see entrepreneurship um, slash business being incorporated within the footwear training curriculums. That was what was missing from my experience. And as a result, I've always been, I've always open sourced that component of my learning. Talent plus business knowledge and forward slash intellect, I guess, means. Um, but anyway, so, so George, the, that is precisely what FIT is up to, right? And, I, you know, given the, the conversation that um, Nicolene and Duane was just engaged in now, what are your thoughts on, on trying to bypass formal education? Uh, well, I think we have to do that. I've been, I've been on the other side and I know the bureaucracy and that's half the problem. In South Africa, for the international audience, we have to understand the South African government wants to control um, trade and, 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 and learning and learning in the country. So uh, with the result that they have a formal qualification, which was drawn up, uh, but no one has actually used it for footwear design. Um, and that is a, a certified course but because we don't have enough skilled people to train potential designers, um, they obviously don't use it. But that is the official South African uh, standards and qualification. Um, it's a, a two, three year diploma. And um, however, we, we need to find a new model, um, which is what the, the previous guys were, were discussing, uh, sort of blended uh, a blended model where you have an academy, but um, yeah, again, I, I reel in uh, back to what Dwayne said in terms of it's more than a sketch. Um, anyone, can, anyone can sketch, but it's the process. Um, if you cannot think the sketch through the making process and the machinery, the, 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 the integrity of the materials, then you, you, you cannot you cannot uh, you cannot execute it, um, which leads me to the next thing, which somehow the, the fundamental issue here is I have a problem with um, the term designer. Um, what and who qualifies to use this term? Thank you. There's there's this distortion um, yes. purely because you can draw something fancy, you you become a designer. Hey, some I, people I, don't draw. <laughs> <laughs> it's virtual design so uh, that is that is one of the the, the, the biggest issues i have you, you need to have a basic grasp of of the technology of the materials their properties um and and the creative and, and the creative skills because it, it's a it's a complete thing um and that's what makes good designers uh, good designers um so i think that once we, we clarify, and, and I, I don't have the answer, I, I think I know what I would term a footwear designer, um, but I'm not sure everybody would agree with me in, in that sense. So therein lies the rub. The institutions uh, will not accommodate uh, the, 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 the person in the chat room. Uh, they, they, they do not want to teach entrepreneurship with design. 
um, and, and they're missing the whole point because it's, it's a package. When, you, when you're designing, you, you're designing with, with a client or a buyer in mind at a given price point for a specific purpose. You know, so you need that. That's the fundamentals. It's not a one-off thing that I come back to. It's more than just a fancy sketch. Yes. Um, it's it's the, the, the bridge between a school, academy, call it what you want, a formal institution, because I think there are elements they can teach uh, uh, if needs be, mm -hmm. but, more, but more importantly, the opportunity to link in with the practical manufacturers so that students can actually get the hands-on feel and actually be part of that making process. So it's not a theoretical undertaking, it's a practical undertaking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. So given the fact that Africa presents its own completely unique challenges, um, you know, we also have seen though that the opportunities are abundant and Chirinma, your, your academy is obviously trying to tap into the opportunities that this presents. Um, but, you know, what are, like, give me just one of the, the most, you know, prolific challenge that you're facing at the moment and how you guys are overcoming that. Just one. <laughs> Your favorite one. <laughs> I was sitting there like, okay, let me see which one she's going to answer. Right? <laughs> so it's quite tricky to like, you know, just point this one. When we started, um, one, <laughs> let me just say that, um, first of all, in Nigeria, we are like years behind. Um, America and the rest of the world in footwear manufacturing. Fine, we do make shoes here, but um, I do consider um, the ability to consistently um, produce high quality footwear that can, you know, compete with global standards like shoe making, and that is not what's happening here. Then on the other side, in terms of footwear education most of the footwear knowledge has been passed down through a system we call the apprenticeship system, which only favors men, in which case they go, to, they go through a 10-year program where they serve um, a traditional shoemaker. And most times the shoemakers have served a shoemaker. So it's been passed on from generation to generation. There has been no innovation, there has been no changes, and that was one of the reasons why we wanted to come in. The biggest challenge we have have is that uh, we wanted to solve was to get more young people into the shoe making industry because unlike the rest of the world we shoe making was once considered a, a a vocation for poor people so we most of the most most parents did not and would not want their kids to be shoemakers it, it wasn't something you would wake up and say oh i want to be a shoemaker traditionally most Young people get into the university to study medicine, engineering, nursing, you know, maybe vocations that are, that will give you more money. And shoemaking, people didn't go to school to learn shoemaking. And are there schools for shoemaking? Yes, but the academic, most of the shoemakers that come out of the institutions are not even shoemakers. They don't, we have had um, um, times of hired people that have gone through the um, traditional institutions and they couldn't even make shoes themselves. So we are faced with a lot of problems. We have uh, a high rate of youth unemployment in Nigeria. We're trying to get these young people to do something with their time and passion and talent and creativity, working with what they have. And a lot of these young people, because they don't have jobs, can't afford the training or can't afford to travel to uh, maybe South Africa or to Italy or to America to learn um, shoemaking the right way, and which is what we have come in to try and do. For us, most, most of the biggest challenge we have is that we are also limited in our own knowledge and it would be nice, like Nicolene has said, to have like open source materials that will also help us to improve our knowledge, also have like train the trainer programs that will help improve and train other young people and to get us at least, at least to be, um, to start doing, the, um, start doing things the right way. Like right now, we're not even thinking about sustainability in any way, it's still far uh, We're not thinking footwear design. We're still on the, we're still trying to get the traditional manufacturing process right. 
Uh, so, um, and this, this presents a lot of opportunities for, for institutions. It presents a lot of opportunities for brands to jump on it because Nigeria, Africa is an emerging market. There are so much opportunities here. There is no true last um, producing company. We have a lot of leather, but how many of this leather is being, tra is being really um, trans like in the entire food to value chain, there are like opportunities that exist in each of these spaces. And some of the things that we try to do in our academy is try to expose our students to some of these things so that we young people can begin to take hold of this industry, begin to um, uh, collaborate, begin to think outside the box, begin to help develop the industry because it's years behind. Like it's really, really years behind. And, um, but it is a problem and it is an opportunity. So um, yes. We, we also have um, a booming youth population that could be used. So if we have brands jumping in to come train or uh, provide a sort of training for young people here, it would be amazing and we could do so much more. And we're not thinking cheap labor. We are not cheap and we are not, um, I don't want, I don't want to, we don't want to present shoemaking as, oh, Africa continent, because you have a lot of young people, labor is going to shift. No, we want, people to be able to um, come here and see the resources that we have and be able to um, partner with us and collaborate, collaborate with us to produce things out of Africa that is for Africa and also for the global market. Mm -hmm. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> that does. And considering that in the, in the really rapidly approaching future, one in three people will be in African youth, it's really important to start considering things mm -hmm. like that. Um, so Kathleen, you know, do you think that existing collaborative efforts between universities are actually effective in that sometimes students are going over to universities abroad, but not necessarily learning things that can be affected in the countries that they're coming from? I do, because I feel that, um, I feel that in a university setting, the student that's not specifically 100%, I want to do footwear. This is what I want to completely put my life into. Not every student is on that track. And I feel it's important that they have other options to also look at. In the same flip side, I feel that having a footwear certificate program like we have at LaSalle University allows for the, the other outliers who may not have even considered footwear now have this in their backyard. So I think, you know, for the communities of, of university settings and what the, the offerings for especially students that aren't quite sure of their path, it gives them a lot of options and it gives them, you know, resources towards those options. But like I said, I think the collaborative effort within the footwear education source, I mean, really, it's a very small amount of people. Half of them are on this panel right now. So that collaborative of sharing and trying to, you know, point students in the direct, right direction is, is so intrinsic, but it's also so much the, the, the treasure of working in the footwear industry is this collaborative nature. So I'd say yes to both questions, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I have an interesting comment here from one of, the, uh, one of the attendees. It says, I agree with George on why the students need hands-on industry experience. I have a friend who told me that he started design since he was 11. The schools in Senegal would close for three months and many children would go work with a designer for the holidays and that's how they got industry experience. It's not a conventional way of education, but it works. I think that's pretty interesting. Um, and then I have a question, I guess. Um, what percentage of the footwear industry is still 2D, as in hand sketching, sketchbook, and Adobe Illustrator versus 3D, like Blender, Modo, Roman Cat, etc.? Anyone want to feel that? So I'll say a shout out to Dariush because I do know him, so I'm glad <laughs> you put that question up. Um, and I can only speak for the, the universities that I've worked in is that they're still, um, a majority of it is still hand sketching, um, sketchbook, and, and Illustrator. Um, I think that a specialized program like the Footwearist is where you really want to jump into the 3D modeling and, and that specific industry-led type of curriculum. 
Well, it's, it's actually changing very rapidly right now. So with COVID, uh, the need for working remotely and being able to do more 3D has increased a lot. So I see that in the need for my courses, but also the people that I have educated before, they're all employed, they are up to here in work. Anybody who's doing good 3D modeling at the, at the moment is, is really uh, overloaded. So, but still, I mean, it, overall in the industry, we're still beginning. So when we, we do webinars as well on this, when we ask people, People right at the beginning of COVID, uh, how many people already have uh, digital design in place? It would be about 20% that, and that was mainly the larger corporations that had some kind and not even full end to end, but some kind of digital design and the rest didn't have any. So at, at that point, so there's opportunities throughout the, the industry. So that's both in the Western Hemisphere and on the African continent. Since in general, we do need that transition towards more digital um, skills. And I just answered uh, for those interested uh, in the Q&A, there was a question on free software. So I typed uh, what I know Thank you. software you can get, uh, where you can find that. Mm -hmm. um, because indeed that is available. There are great packages available to you, which still means that, you know, just the package is not going to teach you to design. Like Dwayne mentioned before, you need to be able to, it's a skill of thinking more than it is a skill of knowing how to use a computer program. But it's definitely, uh, it's opening up a lot of opportunities for people that otherwise would not normally have access. So this really levels the playing field um, a lot for people so mm -hmm. also for those uh, who are listening who are interested in that so there's a footwear design group on facebook um and there you can find from the files i made a whole file i'm one of the moderators i made a whole file with any free tutorial course a program whatever that i know for footwear design that people could could ha could find online so that and people can add to that there's a couple of people in the footwear design group that are uh, experienced designers that also teach uh online some for free some not fully for free but there's actually a lot of uh, can do right now when they want to gain uh, knowledge. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, Thank I would, you very I much. Add, I would also add that, I mean, I'll simplify this where there's three buckets of, of a designer. There's the, the person who sketches, um, there's the person who makes, and then, then there's a person who does a 3D, right? And they're all three different people because they learn three different ways because you can enter in just being a maker like not sketching at all but you can make something come to life by using your hand and then there's the same thing if someone who can't sketch but they can use the digital tools like nobody else right where i can tell you for the young folks out there and whoever like there's no age you will need to know all three yeah because well, you I know all three you'll be you'll get a job a lot faster than if you only had one of the three or if you have two of the three Definitely. because it's going to get a whole lot more competitive yeah. and covid has laid off a lot of talented people so the, the the companies are excited because they have a bigger talent pool than they've ever had before which means if you are new to the industry you have to elevate your skills even more because now you're competing with people who've been in the industry for multiple years. Now, the, the trick will be is we don't know where that person is. They probably don't do 3D because they probably wouldn't have lost their job. Because that's, 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 that's well, not, not, like they, they're not losing jobs. Like they can't find people, right? The, the maker person is in high demand as well, right? The person who just makes hot sketches. Not so you're going to have a lot of hot sketches to yourself, okay? Uh, because yeah. you are a dime a dozen, all right? And you need to elevate your skills in these other areas to make yourself more valuable. Yeah. yeah. What you even see now, which is, I mean, making, like, like Dwayne says, making is uh, needed more and more and more also because you have an understanding of how stuff can be manufactured. Yeah. But you also have the route, which is, again, another route that I see, because I see also some questions coming in, so what can, can Nigerian industry do? Um, is even the reverse engineering way where you have a handcrafted shoe or prototype which you could scan and then do digital editing on that or yeah. so there are actually shorter and shorter routes even also with cheaper and cheaper equipment 
um, that might cost you only, I mean, the printers, for instance, that we make wearable footwear, the printers that we use are, are not even $500. So it's not mm -hmm. about having very expensive equipment. Uh, you also have to have like uh, online services now or things that you can scan with your phone. I mean, all that, all that technology is increasing and it's all offering opportunities for anybody, whether you're in the Western Hemisphere or in a developing country, um, for anybody to get started with with more accessible equipment, just need people to to guide you how to do it. So people like Chidinma who have these academies who can teach people how to combine all these tools and 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 move forward. Uh, that's that's really what we what we need. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the next, uh, the, this question was emailed to me ahead of this talk um, by uh, Carol. Um, she is from, I, I hope, NACE concept. But anyway, I think Cyril, Chidinma and George could probably feel this one. And it is, her question is, what sort of access is needed to get African designers some exposure, to get them better and more meaningful exposure? Anyone can go first. Okay, so um, I mean, from, from my side, I think um, I saw some of the comments where um, a lot of people were talking about <clears throat> apprentices don't really work um, for them. But in, on our side, apprenticeship is important, um, you know, because if someone can get into the industry, if they can learn from people that are, that are skilled, um, they kind of upskill themselves. So I think, again, it comes to localization and where exactly you are on the continent. Uh, in South Africa, internships are actually quite crucial. So I think that's, that would be probably, um, you know, sort of a good start. Um, and then I think, you know, again, you know, I'm still going to beat that same drum in terms of it's the passion that the individual has. Because I think the panelists have all said, you know, that, um, yes, having the right education could be um, an advantage, but not necessarily a certificate or a, a degree or a diploma. It's kind of like, how hungry are you really to learn? And I think you'll kind of put yourself in situations where you'll really want to upskill yourself. So from a South African perspective, um, internships are, are good. I also want to pick up on that comment where um, I think Chijuma said, she spoke about the, the men to women ratio. And, and again, that's an interesting thing to understand in terms of, um, African culture, you know, so it's not just, uh, you know, it's not just a um, something that's, that's not really prevalent. It's, it is so, it's, it is so um, crucial because, you know, the footwear industry most probably told that that's not for them. You know, it's just, it's a, it's a man's job or, or, or something like that. So I think stigmas, culture, you know, all of these things kind of play a massive role. And I think Discussions like this is important because what it does is it gives a platform to open up communication, you know, and, and if there are parents that are listening, if there are, uh, you know, people that, that have that kind of stigma, it's nice to break that, to kind of be like, listen, you know, there's opportunity for all, you know, and I think one shouldn't really sort of classify it according to your gender, um, but it, it really is, again, location, where you are, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Chidenma, would you like to go next? Okay, what I'll just like to say is that I agree with Cyril. Um, interestingly, from the work that we're doing, even right now, we have more women, more young women in our training classes than men. And this is something that has never really happened before. I'm, I'm very <laughs> certain when, we ent when I got into the industry, we did en encounter a lot of um, resistance, especially from the older shoemakers who were male and didn't think women and should, this should be a women industry or something. So right now I'm really excited that more, a lot of, there are a lot of young women that are getting into the industry. 65% women attendance to, to men attendance in our training classes and this is like really really amazing. Um, um, the, in terms of access, truth is that footwear um, education, one of the um, things we, when we started out was that a lot of people that were interested couldn't afford training. So we had to find a way to bring this training for free to them 
So we had to partner with um, NGOs, try to reach out to the government to see if there was if there were like funding uh, opportunities to train young people. And, and this is still the uh, um, problem that most academic, uh, most schools in Nigeria or some parts of Africa will probably still face to today. Because if we don't get funding to train people, we probably won't make a lot of money to keep staying in business. So um, we still need to depend on institutions. We, even though we're a for-profit organization, we still need to find a way to bring this training to young people for free and still be able to make our money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. George, your input? What type of footwear do you yeah. train your students with to, to make? I'm sorry. Um, like traditional, like decolade, um, male Oxford, like most of the shoes that we wear here traditionally, like like Oxford, loafers, um, decolade, no sandals or sneakers, not sneakers. Um, what? Yes. Come on. It's very classic shoes. <laughs> George, would you like to chime in there? <laughs> yeah, um, I, I have to <clears throat> put it in the South African context. Um, you know, historically, with our system of apartheid, uh, we had job reservation. So we still have this mentality of exclusivity. And you mm -hmm. find, now you find we have a situation where um, indigenous black people are actively discriminated against in the footwear industry. Um, there are virtually no indigenous blacks in the hierarchy of the South African footwear manufacturers. Um, virtually zero females and black female even worse. Yeah. So that whole mentality has to change for starters. If we're going, so for the young man who wants looking for, for uh, um, a, an opportunity to do practical work, uh, is auto, he or she is automatically blocked um, if the vacancy does, uh, if an opportunity does arise, it is for things like uh, time and motion study. Um, it's something lower, uh, but the exclusivity of design, range building, um, that is predominantly left, uh, left to, to um, the upper classes as, as it was in the old days, because one has got to understand it design we inherited uh, traditionally foreigners came in and they headed design in 1979 i was the first uh, black person to do a formal qualification in south africa up to that point you could become a pattern cutter that was the highest level wow and that was a, an ingenious way of keeping people out of the system yeah. because automatically when I became a designer, I had to be paid on par with the Italian, the German, the Englishman designer that came in. And that was one way of excluding, ex uh, excluding uh, black people from the, from the design sector. Um, mm -hmm. So effectively uh, in 79, I was the first and they trained maybe six or seven more uh, designers. And then that program fell flat. Uh, so after that, we've effectively not had a, a formal design qualification. Mm. So um, this is still happening. Unfortunately, this is still happening. People will phone in and they'll deny this, but I can tell you it's de facto, it is still happening. Um, it's the same in retail. Um, and you, you will not, they, they don't, people don't realize that um, indigenous black people, like everybody else, they're creative. They, they just naturally gifted to, to innovate, but they need opportunities. And here again, I mean, it, it's to, to, to Dwayne's point. I mean, you know, it starts out with a pencil, but it's, it's a matter of cobbling together with bits and pieces. And if the parallel thing, if you see some of the, the wire carts and other objects that are made with bottle caps and old cans, um, that is creativity in its purest form. Absolutely. It's engineered. You know, but there's an automatic block. I mean, currently now to, to do a proper footwear certified uh, footwear course in South Africa, you need to be a designer for four years to be able to do this course. Now, it's a bit of an oxymoron because how do you become a designer if you're blocked in the first place? Yeah. And I mean, I was, on, I was, I was part of this team that put the, the qualification together and, and I butted heads 
And I said, this is daft. Purely, you, can, you need a portfolio of evidence. Let people just show what they can do. All you have to then do is, it's, it's like the tennis coach or the golf coach. Don't change the person's stroke. Work with what they've got and build on their strengths. Yeah. But it's about opportunities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great point. Um, okay, I'm going to read some of the questions that um, I've not actually been able to get around to answering as yet. Um, all right, so standard and institutionalized footwear education is relatively unknown here in Nigeria. While it is not affordable to acquire it elsewhere, what advice do you have for us, the young shoemakers here, on improving footwear and design and technology, please? And I guess this means like, you know, if you're unable to leave Nigeria. Kathleen, I think maybe that might be an interesting one for you and Dwayne to catch. Well, I mean, I, I definitely think reaching out to Chittima and her academy would be excellent. Uh, I think that we need to find some support measures. So even her footwear academy and how the processes of what they're making can go online and be taught. Um, so I think some, I mean, I do think that there needs to be support for the programming. So even if it's online um, directives or, or helping in that approach, um, other than that, I, I, there's so many free MOOCs. Um, there's one, you know, on, uh, what is it, Cyril, uh, Future Learn. Future mm -hmm. Learn has a lot of free, um, you know, oh, basic yeah. footwear development and sustainability and, and material, you know, aspects of selecting different types of innovation for design. So you can, you can start with the free online programming. Um, but the more that you can connect with academic within your country, I think the more localized training you'll get, but then always, you know, look around to other sources to kind of feed other curiosities that you may have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dwayne, I'll pass mm -hmm. it on to you now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I guess, I, I'm, I guess I'm trying to think through a more tactical approach of, of it. How do we get Nigerian kids to, to, to the US, right? And, and how, how do we create an exchange program where we, we and, and I think we, we, we were talking about this a few years ago about creating specific programming here for, for, for South African kids to come to, to, come to Pencil and, and hang out with us for a little bit um, and bring back the, the, the way that we do things here to elevate what you do there or expand kind of what you do there. Because mm -hmm. I, I hear the, I, I hear the, the, I hear it in your voice of, you know that they have the ability to do more than what they're able to do. Um, and, if, and if somehow, what, even if we can't get them here, there's, there's things we could do digitally, Kathleen as well. Yeah, so, no, I think so too, because I think we, you know, we worked really closely with University of Johannesburg and they gave us every opportunity for almost a circular exchange of students between learning sustainability in Johannesburg to learning and, and Johann, you know, uh, SA students learning footwear skills here in the US. And it was this great circular model. And where, where the problem was, was the US accreditation system blocked any type of, yeah, yeah. you know, full circular exchange because University of Johannesburg was ready to to give us the silver platter to our students coming there, but we couldn't reciprocate. So I think that it goes down to a you know just the the surface of how do we open up the academic structure between globalization of all these different countries. Um, yeah, that's yeah. not part of any of those organizations. Mm -hmm. I would like to see it happen where, where the university, so instead, uh, Kathleen, where the universities would send um, instructors. So one thing that we talked about when we were preparing for this webinar, what we need first is train the trainer programs yeah, because absolutely. you can, you can focus on uh, the students right away, but we don't have enough instructors. So if you want to, you first want to train instructors. Uh, especially now with COVID situation, uh, getting a lot of people out of African countries into the U.S. or or Europe for that matter would be difficult. So, uh, much rather either start very pragmatically online if that's the only thing we can do for now, um, and then send people over um, to academies like Chidinmas 
to be able to train people. She can now see in the program that she has, where she undoubtedly has some students where she's like, oh, these are good, motivated people that I could train further um, into, into instructors so that I can expand um, the program. That's something I'd love to support. I'm making now a couple of free videos for her. They're going to be finished this weekend, Chidema. <laughs> <laughs> And um, but also I would like to invite any of the of the other panelists to help help out on on that and also get more companies involved there because there's a lot of um, opportunity and a lot of things that I think we can already do without having to you know I can imagine just as relatively few Americans have a passport I don't think that that many Nigerians might have a passport either to to you know. Uh, <laughs> out and 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 enter the u.s so so trying right, to go true. that route is going to be a tough a tough yeah, one. yeah I, I got a passport i can't use it right now but oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Uh, but no you you know a, a former student of a former student of ours I, I challenged him with with an idea of making a sneaker with no machines mm -hmm. and he, he delivered on it right yeah. and, and so we're in the process of him shooting a video documenting how to actually do this process that he created and i think that could be a really interesting one to send your way um because you have all of the tools you need at your, okay. at, your at your academy i'm pretty sure um the only part you might not have is just solid rubber sheets um but beyond that you have everything else you need and mm -hmm. It's it's a really interesting way of of, of uh, looking at shoes. It was part of the conversation we had before we started, where I was like, okay, okay. the biggest hangup for people making shoes is they need a sewing machine and they mm -hmm. need a mold to make an outsole, and so that was the challenge I asked him. I was like, well, make. I, I actually gave him an envelope and said, there's a shoe in here. Let me see what it looks like. <laughs> and the caveat is you cannot use a machine. Yeah. No, that's exactly one of the videos that I'm shooting right now, which is about where you can actually use the need for sustainable footwear, which can be disassembled as an advantage because all those constructions are relatively simple. They either have no machinery or very few machinery or only one. Um, so I think that's a great opportunity for, for the African continent to, to get started from and also to then grow towards, for instance, indeed sneaker manufacturing that we talked about, the way sneakers are made now it has been... Mm -hmm amplified over the years a lot so but the market has a lot of leather so it's great it's it's a great yeah. use so shoes like the 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 bendy shoe that you have from from the u.s which is actually a, a sole that you could also get in china and a, and a hand stitched upper to it you know there there are so many different opportunities that you could have to make shoes that are suitable either for the local market and for export and even address the need for sustainable footwear and could incorporate um, the African design that people are looking um, for. So you could bring all that together and, and be resourceful and just be smart about what you what you teach and do and get people going without having to make it highly um, complicated. Uh, so that because it makes no sense to teach people something that they don't then don't have the means uh, to do. I had a school in Ghana approach me before where they wanted all kinds of sewing machines and I was like, it's great to have, but where'd you get the power to run them? And then secondly, <laughs> they don't have the machine. So I mean, that's, then it stops right there. So, so that's not what we, what we necessarily. Mm -hmm. mm, thank you, Nico. Um, so Cyril, I think maybe you can feel this one. Um, this was also one of the email questions saying that not enough research is being done to allow African indigenous artisanal knowledge to filter through to mainstream education, um, specifically within design. How can we change this rhetoric? You know, I mean, I think I love what uh, Duane said in that you already have what you, you already have everything you need. You know, and um, I think that rhetoric needs to be dispersed because, or bust because we, we always sort of say it's always best from the West, you know, and, um, and, and the thing is, you know, we have so much here, you know, and I think, um, yes, you know, um, I love the concept of training the trainer. I think that is, that is phenomenal. And I think if we can have sort of like those buddy systems, you know, in terms of sort of equipping, you know, and, and I think something that's so refreshing, um, you know, we, from this sort of discussion is that the answers are actually quite simple. You know, it's not complicated, 
you know, um, you know, I mean, Kathleen was talking about the, um, you know, the relationship between the US and, and South Africa. And, and I'm sure that there's a way to bypass the red tape around that, you know, whether it's a, a profiled person who sort of says, listen, I'm going to get involved. You know, people that have, there are many US uh, profile people that have initiatives in Cape Town, in, South, in Johannesburg, you know, and, and can kind of make things happen to bypass those systems. So something like this, you know, this particular question would be teaming up with the right people, the right buddies in the right specific areas and expertise, because the solutions are actually within our reach. You know, it's not impossible. We can do it, um, but we just need the right sort of channels. Um, I think maybe sometimes we, you know, we complicated ourselves, you know, by sort of going through the red tape and trying to be in a system that, that doesn't get, get us any solutions. So we almost need to be a bit of um, a renegade and, you know, just sort of be like, okay, well, we're just going to go in the total opposite direction because if the current system is not working, then we've just got to break it, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. yes. Thank you very much for that. <clears throat> um, so George, I think there's one that I think might be interesting for you to field here as well. American brands such as Brother Feliz have been successful in creating small batch footwear manufacturing workshops within communities in Africa. How can this model be systemized and optimized to apply to other brands interested in manufacturing there? And that comes from Kelly. Um, yeah. <clears throat> I think to go back to what Dwayne alluded to earlier on um, about helping or getting involved uh, other than um, in America. I mean, his initial take was that people go from Africa to America. Situation being what it is, that's going to be impractical, but the pandemic won't be with us forever. I'd, I'd rather look at a model where you have some form of twinning or collaboration where let you have a host academy in South Africa um, and you've got, a, you've got a, 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 a group of students which can share the facilities. Um, and then obviously you can still be tutored and, and uh, impart, impart knowledge from wherever or Nicolene or whoever wants to do that kind of thing. Um, and that's how you can then tap in because there's a tripartite uh, uh, partnership. This You need to, to actually turn this into a practical thing because ultimately you want to create employment. So if you have the right mentorship and a place, and a place uh, where you can swap these ideas and make it happen, I think you'll find interested companies who are prepared because uh, no Retail, well, no manufacturer is going to um, trust you with their brand if they're not sure that you're going to honor it. Uh, there's things like trust issues, copying, um, all sorts of things. So it's more than just um, doing small batch. It's, it's a relationship and, and one has got to build that up as well. But I think if you have a, a credible uh, uh, team, uh, it's an easier sell. Uh, and I, I, I'm going to hasten to add uh, I can see going forward, post-pandemic, uh, we saw with the reliance on importation from, especially the, from China, uh, and the non-delivery. Local companies, local retailers are going to be forced to look at small batch manufacturing mm -hmm. in, a, in a more rapid turnaround time. But <laughs> that's where you need local designers and te uh, technicians that can, that can work with these little companies. Um, that's how I see it panning out. So there's going to be an urgent need for these academies. And I, I think we cannot wait for institutions or government to, to make this happen. This has got to be driven from the people up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. no, you're right, George. It's, it's actually happening here in the States too. Um, it, it's happening here. And uh, there, there's more and more... Um, not necessarily academies, but facilities where you can make product, right? And, um, and, and they are doing it for commercial purposes with, with the idea of being closer to consumer and responding to consumer demand. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, you're right, it's, it's happening. It is definitely happening. 
Mm -hmm. All right. So um, I have, I think, oh, what, Dwayne, here's an interesting one for you. Paul Irving wants to know, when will you set up an academy in Africa? I saw that question, Paul, um, and I was, I was, I'm trying to think about how to answer it. And, and I wonder if, if you are friends with uh, the, the young lady on, on the panel here and you planted that seed. Uh, um, but um, I don't know physically setting up, but I can definitely see uh, us collaborating um, and, 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 and physically doing some things. And, and it, to, to um, Kathleen's point and, and Nicolene's point is it, it could start virtually with the idea of building up the funding to to make it make sense to come over there um and and instead of bringing people here it, we can go there um but I, I do believe there there's an exchange that needs to happen because even our u.s kids need to get out of the u.s you know we we, we need to grow and expand <laughs> our horizons um because you know I, I taught in europe for for a few years and i was just really fascinated with how the European education system allows students to go from country to country. And you can't do that in the United States. Like you can't hop around to different states and go to school because they're all individual little businesses and compete with each other. So what ends up happening is the student loses in the equation because their knowledge is, is, is limited. I think there's just as much value as kids from where I'm from, Inglewood, California, going to Nigeria and hanging out with you for for whatever set period of time and then your kids coming here and hanging out with us like that type of exchange that's how you grow as a creative because now you're around new creative inputs yeah. and when you expand your creative inputs the output becomes different and and i feel bad for these u.s kids because their input is limited and the european kids have a broader input and, and so if I can create that, if we, if we can create that together, I would absolutely, well, not, not if, when we create that together, then we'll get closer to that happening, Paul. Okay. I have, I have, I I have an think. idea. I have an idea. I have an idea. I'm, I'm going to talk to you about it offline. I have an idea. Okay. Okay. I just uh, like to say that this is amazing because I sorry, um, Rivana. I, no, no, go ahead. I was speaking to someone at the okay, so I was speaking to um the diplomat that was in charge of Southeast Nigeria, and we have been thinking of ways in which um the U.S. consulate can actually help develop help programs that can develop the um future industry over here. So it's a conversation we can definitely get started on, and I'll be interested in seeing how it goes. Okay. Yeah, we, we need to get rid of some, this dude in D.C. first. So once, <laughs> once we can get rid of that thing, then, then we can definitely do, do that. <laughs> all right, fabulous. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, all right, there are just three more questions that I think I'd like to address because they've been sitting here for a little bit. Uh, footwear manufacturing in Africa is in, almost entirely based on leather and more traditional materials like uh, PVC. Oh, God. Do you think there is a space for new materials and technologies like polyurethanes and 3D printing in the market? And if so, how do we leverage on education to scale up this knowledge across the continent? I think, Nico, you kind of addressed this quite yeah quite um, in, in depth as well. So I'm going to consider that one answered as well. Um, what could organizations more so in the private sector across the value chain, um, material manufacturers, for example, do to play a bigger role in footwear education and leverage on the same to grow their businesses? Anyone? That was a long question. That was a really long question. I'll, I'll type it out to him. I've, 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 I'll, I'll be able to, whatever questions I haven't been able to get to in this chat, um, for all the participants who have actually typed questions that I haven't gotten to, I will be typing you out emails after um, the webinar is over just to make sure that your, your concerns and your questions have been addressed. The last poll that I just ran now was what role do you fulfill in the industry? We've got 8% of educators, 29% designers, 5% technicians, brand owners, no retailers, and others. We have female um, technicians and 
Okay, and shoemakers, I guess. Um, all right, so I'm gonna end that poll. Thank you very much to everyone who took part in the poll. Um, all right, so I think that I'm just gonna end off with two minutes each. And I'd like you to just give within two minutes, what is the next action that we need to take? What is the next, or even, even if it's just a call to action that we need to take and what we need to do next. We've, we've identified so many gaps and so many opportunities and an equal amount of challenges as well. So if you were to just summarize it, I will start off with Chidinma. I would just like to say that Africa is right, especially in Nigeria, and we have hungry young people willing to learn shoemaking, willing to do so much more. We have resources, we have leather, we have our Ankara material, we have so much really. And my call to action would be, please look, look at ways in which you could um, help us um, get to where you are. Look, look at ways in which you, know, you could just, because definitely it will come back. It will come back to, it will come back and give you back your return on investment. If you're investing with young people in Africa that will, you know, bring, bring fresh ideas to the industry. So we are, a, we are a people that have been overlooked for long. And right now I'm very excited to say that we have young people that are ready to do amazing things because they're coming from a diverse background and they can contribute so much more. So as I'm fingers crossed, I'm ready to work with anybody that is ready to collaborate and um, give us open source materials to <laughs> reach out to more young people and impact more people. Thank you. Thank you, today, my Kathleen. Yeah, I, I think um, I learned a lot even from this panel in, in knowing that there needs to be more experiential components of how we're delivering footwear. And uh, Chidema, I, I think that, you know, I know that you're in the thick of things right now, but I do think on how you're teaching and how you're experiencing this role of being, you know, the leader of the academic uh, for your academy, um, I think that in itself is what other people can learn from as well. Um, and I think that how you are also teaching uh, footwear, other people can learn from as well. So I think that on one level, you know, please uplift your experience because I think people and, and myself included would love to learn from that. And I'd love to see um, more, I mean, on my end, I know I'm going to work harder at opening up more of the university and college level institutions and speak more about that to the voices that will listen. Um, for right now at LaSalle University, I have those voices that listen and they give scholarships and they open up these programs. So I'm excited for that and working with them. But I think for education, the bigger picture needs to continue to be discussed because we're not able to do student exchanges and we're not able to have this experience as much so how do we then support the technology needed to have as much virtual experience as possible? So, thank and, and thank you, Ridwana, for having us here today. Thank you very much, Kathleen. George, you're next. Um, well, I'd like to see this conversation continuing uh, at various levels. It could be one-on-one -on -one with, with other panelists, could be with uh, people who've written in, uh, and um, because I think we need to continue this conversation. On a, on a practical level, I'd like to see more reciprocal um, sharing of ideas um, because this can be done virtually as well, uh, electronically and, and so on and so forth. Um, and, and that is, is uh, so that the takeaway here is uh, something that one can build on as opposed to just having spent 90 minutes chatting about it and moving on. Um, in the meantime, uh, this new model um, has to be concretized, uh, developed, and saying um, what form will it take, who are the possible players, and who are the potential to, to make this thing. And that's what I mean by, by sharing of ideas and seeing how we can build on uh, and, and up uh, from there. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, George. Cyril? Um, from my side, you know, 
thing that's really apparent from this discussion is there's so much to do. You know, there's so much to do. Um, not from an overwhelming point of view, but just in terms of um, opportunity. I think when we had the prep discussion earlier this week, one of the things we spoke about was call to action post this discussion. And I think it would be a miss of us to sort of just have this webinar and then it just kind of sort of filters out and, and nothing gets, you know, nothing happens. So wherever from my side that I could assist on a fashion revolution South Africa point of view, I can assist um, and willing to put my hand up. And I think, you know, something that really stood out to me is Georgia's story of 1979. And I think for me as a person of color in South Africa, in especially a time that we have right now, where we've got the Black Lives Matter movement uh, and so much that's happening around the world, um, everybody on this panel has got such incredible knowledge and has got so much to share that we need to sort of put it out there because, you know, these stories need to be told. There's a generation that's coming up. There's a generation that doesn't know what's happened and how things have happened through, through the years, through the systems in South Africa specifically. Um, and, you know, we need to tell that. And George, from, from my side, you know, I would love to meet with you in Cape Town you know, and sort of connect with you and, uh, and take that forward. Um, and then thank you, lastly, to Kathleen for, you know, sort of suggesting myself to Rudwana and for this opportunity to be in, even though I'm not in the footwear industry, um, I've just learned so much tonight just from sitting back and listening, uh, but, but really sort of bubbling inside thinking, wow, there's so much opportunities and we could, we could do so much more. Thanks. Thank you very much, Cyril. Nico. Sorry. <laughs> um, no, I, I, well, you know, I'm a pragmatic person, so I would really like to uh, suggest that we, that we plan a, a, another call non-public uh, with those of the panel that are interested. I'm very interested to, to you know, make concrete steps uh, also definitely together with you, Duane, to start with training the trainer programs with helping Chidima and uh, other um, people that are trying to get education off the ground in, in African countries. I had planned my summer, that's also how I got in touch with uh, Chidin Man, her husband Mendley. I had planned to be in Africa right now, because uh, I had actually planned the whole tour this summer, which did not happen uh, but because of COVID, and I still want to make that happen as soon as I can, uh, to also, you know, visit the countries and understand better from being there what can be done, what the needs are. I see a lot of great questions about what raw materials that are local can be used. I'm sure there's lots, you know, so I'd, I'd love to explore more, see that and do that. And while we cannot do that, let's at least get going online with what we can do now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Nico. Dwayne, we'll end with you. Um, oh, that's pressure. Uh, <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> Well, well, first, I, I want to I wanna thank you for, for inviting me. Um, you know, we, we, we talk sporadically on WhatsApp every once in a while. Um, so it's, it, you always bring a smile to my face when I see your name pop up on my phone. So, so thank you um, for allowing me to spend 90 minutes plus with you today. So that was great. And then it was, it was unbelievable to meet each of you. Um, and and to, to your point, um, Cyril, hey, you know, I would love to have a conversation after, you know, with, with anyone who wants to. Um, I'm, 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 I'm in my little bubble here in Portland, you know, but, um, but I, I, I would like to think I have a lot to give and, and in whatever I have to give. And if you want to receive it, I'll be glad to give it to you. Okay. Um, and uh, to Denma, we are obviously going to work together. Right. And so if, if, if anything that comes out of this conversation is, I, I want to figure out a way, which I actually have a pretty, pretty, what I think is a good idea. To, to figure out a system to create some funding and, and bring attention to what you're doing in, in Nigeria. Um, I, I don't know everybody that's black in this industry, but I kind of know a lot of everybody that's black in this industry. And I can tell you that um, a female shoemaker in the United States, I only know two, oh. like two. And so, you know, you are definitely a purple unicorn. Um, and, uh, and I think people need to see who you are and, and know who you are and what you're doing. And, and more importantly, um, figure out a way to get your kids to make some sneakers because I'm pretty sure they would probably want to make sneakers more than some dress shoes. 
And so if we can figure out how to make that happen, uh, you might have more yeah. people come to your class. Uh, but I, I have I have a I have a pretty interesting idea I wanna I wanna run past you and, and, and see if we can make happen. Um, but um, now today this was this was awesome. one of the best best times I've spent on looking at my computer in the last five months. Um, <laughs> so for an extended period of time. Uh, so I, I appreciate that. Um, and and I'm I'm super excited about what's possible. Um, and one day I want I want to get over to where you are um, because it's 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 I've traveled a lot of places around this world and and that is one destination that's that's high on on the priority list. It's just I've only traveled for business purposes and my business has never led me there. But now, uh, now I have an excuse. You know, it's a tax write-off, right? But at the same time, <laughs> uh, I'm gonna hang out and, and have fun and embrace and just be someone that that gets a chance to learn from all of you as well. Amazing! Thank you. There's so much synergy happening right here. To all the attendees for this webinar, I really thank you for your time. You guys have hung on such a long time. Thank you very much. And to my panelists, I asked you for one and a half hours and you've given me more. So thank you very much for that. I really appreciate it. Um, I'd like to end off with what I really hope will come out of this conversation. And that is to just have people's minds open a little bit. I think that we tend to work in silos in this industry and we tend to not actually want to throw the, the rope down to other people and help them up. And conversations like this can change that rhetoric um, in, in ways that will be meaningful and ways that will affect change going forward. And each one of you that have taken part in this panel today, you've been asked to be a part of this panel because you're doing that already. And we just need more people like you in the industry. So thank you, thank you so much. And have a really great evening, day, whatever it is now, <laughs> wherever you are. So thank you very much. Thank you. And to all Thank the you. participants, the, the recording will be live on my website. I have posted it a couple of times in the chat. Um, but wherever you found the link to join this webinar is wherever you will find the link to the replay as well. And I think it will be worth, worth watching again. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye now. Thank you. Thank you.